Okay, in this video, we're gonna go over the sales process that allowed us to close more than $200 million in transactions. Now, that money didn't directly come from this sales process, but the deals that were closed did. So the way that our model works is we charge upfront fees to companies that need to raise money. We charge them anywhere between 10 and $25,000. And then we get paid on the back end when they close deals. So regardless of whether we're closing debt or equity for a company, we're gonna take a percentage of whatever is raised. If it's debt, it's less. If it's equity, it's more. And in totality, we've closed more than $200 million in transactions in the past two years. And this is the sales process that we use to close the clients on the front end. So this process can be extrapolated out and used for your offer when you're selling high ticket B2B. The overall premise of this entire process is you demonstrating that you are someone capable of getting the job done. That's all it is, full stop. That is what the process is. It is you showing through your honest signals, through your body language, as well as your communication skills, that you are someone who is intelligent, can solve problems, and is going to work hard. Those are the things that you are trying to convey. Now, there's some things that we need to address in terms of how you are going to position yourself relative to the client or relative to the prospect. Oftentimes, if you're going into an industry that's up market, you are going to feel as though you may not be an adequate person to be in that conversation. There's some internal conflict that's occurring. And the way that we combat this is not only through your belief systems changing, and that's a whole other topic for another video, but an easy way that you can implement some basic things that will increase your status is simply by where you are sitting during the call, the clothes that you're wearing. Now, obviously you're probably not going to have a background like this on your calls, but the closest you can get to this, the better. Basic grooming, basic hygiene, making sure that the lighting is correct. If you have a watch that you can wear, something that potentially looks expensive if you don't have one already, all of these things are going to stack up in your favor. And I touched on honest signals already. Honest signals are your eye contact, your communication skills, your tonality, your body language. All of these things are what you refer to as honest signals. Why? Because as humans, we pick up on them and we can see the truth behind someone's eyes and behind what someone's saying when all of these things are in alignment. Okay, so let's move into the exact process. This is the SOP that I put together for our sales team. And I'm gonna leave a version of this document beneath the video that you can follow along with. There's also gonna be hyperlinked videos and looms that you can watch. So I've already created a similar video to this that the sales team watches. However, for the purposes of teaching you guys and how this applies to a more broad application, I think it necessary for me to go over this because oftentimes I'm talking about closing big fucking deals and and you see it, but there's a detachment from your reality and my reality. And this process is how you can attempt to bridge that reality to come over to the light side. So pre-call responsibilities. The call starts before you even get on Google Meet or Zoom. The foundations of the frame and the perspective that the prospect has will be created before they've even gotten on the call with you. That comes all the way from the top of funnel level. Whatever ad they've seen, whatever email correspondence they've seen, you want to ensure that all of these are as professional as you can possibly make them because those are the first impressions that you are making on the prospect. Now, if you've gotten them to the point where they've agreed to get on the phone with you, you've done something right, but you always want to be optimizing at that top of funnel level. Level. What happens thereafter? It's the pre-call stage. So you need to ensure that your materials that are going out are very professional. If you have an offer that's already built out, you need to make sure that you have professional materials that are going out. The thesis video or the long form BSL that I show people before the call, the indoctrination video I have on YouTube. And that's the only video on this last page of the funnel. Why? Because I want them to click on YouTube. I want them to go and watch other videos. You can see here, they come in here, they can go to the channel and you can see these videos don't have a lot of views. It doesn't matter. Point is the right people are watching them. We have interviews with clients, one for 21.5 million, one for 10 million. And then I've got the longer form videos that they can watch going over case studies and past experience, etc. So you want to make sure that all of these materials 
are as professional as you can make them. I also have the sales letter that people go through. People don't read these, but it's good for them to see that you've actually thought through your process and you have something to back it up. So these are the materials that go out prior to the call and they are of vital importance because again, it pre-frames the engagement. What you do when you're setting the call, you need to have a setter confirm the call if they book themselves or you have a setter that books the call and you need to ensure that you've gone over time frame for onboarding also results what the expected results can be and pricing pricing needs to be discussed prior to the actual call because if a prospect doesn't even have the money for a high engagement fee then there's no use in you talking to them so we always ensure that we have the pricing in the ad or the email at the top of funnel level and then it's also reiterated during the setting process because that way we ensure we're only speaking to people that have the fucking money and obviously you need to confirm the appointment you also need to ensure that they understand to go through as much of the materials that you're going to send out prior to the call as possible because this will mitigate mitigate your need to answer tedious questions. Your job on that call should just be to ask questions, give a high level overview of what you do, and then proceed into the closing. That's what it is. Again, it's an explanation of your ability to provide results. That's what it is. When you're selling high level, they're sophisticated buyers. You don't need to worry about future pacing. You don't need to worry about objection boxes. You don't need to worry about objections. There are no objections. The only objection they have is they don't trust you. That's all it is if you get objections. So how do we ensure that we're in a position where those don't even occur? It happens through those pre-call materials. And I'm going to show you some more information that you can send out as well. So now we got to dive into the actual call. I'm going to show you the structure that I've laid out for the discovery call. Now, the process that I use is a two call process. Now I've got students and I've got guys on our team that do one call. I like multiple calls because when we're dealing 20, 25 K packages, it doesn't matter if the sales cycle is three weeks. If you're taking 10 calls a day, you've got three week sales cycles, you're still making more than enough money. It shows that you do not need their engagement. It shows that you are coming from a place of abundance, that you're not needy. And it also makes them more comfortable because I want there to be as seamless of a process from them transitioning from the close into them becoming a client. I don't want them to be rushed. I want it to be as hands off as possible. I'm doing these calls, but I want them to close themselves. I want them to be fully bought in and ready. That's how I approach sales. And what I found is two calls is more than enough to get this done. By the second call, halfway through, they're ready to get going. They say it themselves, all right? And that's what I'm gonna show you in this process. So you first start off with brief small talk, and then you transition to context. So the small talk is literally a few sentences. Where are you calling from? If you know anything about that city, you talk about that, and then you immediately transition into context. Context is why they're there, how they are there. You saw an ad, you responded to an email, what information have you seen so far? And then from there, you're gonna frame the call. Now, the way that I frame the call is essentially this. This is the basic sentence that you can use to immediately take control of the call and the conversation. You say, I've done some research on your company prior to jumping on with you here today, but I think for context, the best place to start is maybe you just give me some information about your company background, et cetera, and then we can go from there. Boom, you've taken control of the call right there. So you get the client to do their introduction. And the beautiful thing about doing this is you are now in a position where you can conduct relevant discovery based on the things that they are saying. You don't need to have a predetermined set of questions. You just need to understand the information that you need and allow the prospect to talk and pick out the information that you need as they are going through their introduction. So you specifically focus on identifying market validation. This is for the context of capital raising if they are in a position to actually raise money. Is this something that's commercially viable? Are they already making money? But if you're doing something else like demand generation or lead generation or what have you, you focus on if they are already providing results to the marketplace. Why? Because that's going to give you leverage if they aren't in a position already, because you're going to be able to create friction within the conversation and tip the favor within your side of the scale. As I show you later on in the video here, you're going to understand and all the specifics. You essentially just need to have a full understanding of the company from front to back, specifically focusing on the reasons why they're there. And the only reason why people are going to be getting on calls like this is they want to make more money or they want to save money or revenue that they already have, or they want to save money in general. Those are the only reasons why they're going to be able to identify how you can either make them more money or save them money. 
That's all you're trying to do. Now I discussed friction already here. So you want to introduce reasons why the interaction or engagement would not work. The reason why you're doing this is because you're purposefully trying to get them to qualify themselves to you. So in the context of capital raising, if someone said that their valuation was $70 million in their pre-revenue company, that's going to be very difficult for an investor to palette. So you say, okay, where'd you get those numbers from? Do you have audited pro formas that were done from an investment bank? No. All right. You have no revenue. This is going to be difficult to do. You've been trying to do this yourself for how long? How's that been working? What conversations have you been able to garner from the efforts that you have? Okay. You've been trying for a year to do this. You only have a few people in the pipeline and things aren't going very well. Okay. Okay, got it. And you don't have any previous investors. Okay. I have forced them to qualify themselves and be clear on the position that they're actually in by introducing the friction. This is where you ask the harder questions. And I sort of tied in what the current efforts are as well. But you essentially talk about the things that they're doing to solve the problem that they currently have or to generate money in the topic of discussion. Now, these are very specific to capital raising. However, you essentially just need to get, as I said, a full accurate understanding of where the company is in your mind. And then you can move on to Q&A. The easy way to transition to this is I've sent some material over to you prior to the call. Did you get a chance to review it? If the setter did his job, he would have ensured that they already did prior to them even getting on. You know that they did. You just want to get them to say yes and then to ask you questions about the engagement. If you do everything correctly, they're going to start asking you questions like, okay, how much is the engagement? What's the onboarding time like? What are the expected results? And now all you're doing is talking logistics. So eventually they're going to ask you what the price is. When they do that, you say it's going to be in a range. You don't say definitive price. You say it's going to be between five and 15,000, between 10 and 15, between 15 and 20, 25, etc. Or if you want to break it up into a engagement fee plus a monthly, it's going to be 10,000 up front and then 5,000 a month for a six month engagement, whatever it may be. You give them a range and you transition into saying, I don't want to give you anything that we haven't fully thought out in full as a team. So what I'd like to do is take this back with my team. I'd like to review the conversation we've had here today and put together a scope of work that outlines what we've discussed and what our potential solutions to the things that you're facing right now in your business are. And then I would like to present that to you on Monday. Does the same time work for you? And boom, you schedule the next call. And that is how you end the discovery call. So what do we do thereafter? Well, we send out post discovery email and we are trying to mitigate any of the questions that they may have on the second call by sending out more of this information. So we're going to send out interviews. We're going to send out case studies. We're going to send out presentation. We will send out our business registration. And if it's a very good prospect, we will send out a list of references before them even asking us for them because we want to ensure that whatever they need to take care of on their side can take place as quickly as possible. So we front load all the questions that they may have and information that they may want to see and give it all to them without them asking right after the first call, because that way they can go through it as a team. And oftentimes when people ask you for references, they don't even call them or they ask you for case studies. They don't even go through them. They just want to see that you have them. It's a shit test. So just by sending them ingratiates you with the prospect, it increases their confidence in your ability to get the job done. Because if you do it correctly, if you communicate everything correctly, and you're asking intelligent questions, your line of questions is logical, or your line of questioning is logical, then you will have illustrated that you are someone who is in a position to actually provide the results that you are saying that you're going to get them. So when we send this post discovery email template, we are trying to ensure that we take care of any things that may arise after you send the agreement, after you agree to price. And they're like, oh, actually, let me speak to a couple of references. We don't want to have that happen. We send it right away. All right. So now we move on to the closing call. So the closing call in its simplest form is just to answer any questions that they have about the process that you are going to unfold for them, but your program, but your offer, your service, how you're going to provide results. You are just demonstrating a further explanation of how you are going to get the job done. That is all you're doing on this call. So you would have already sent over the post discovery call materials and an agreement, potentially scope of work. What 
whatever it may be. And when you jump on this call, again, you do the small talk, you do the, the context, and then you set the agenda. And essentially you say, listen, we've discussed most of the things that I needed on my end on the previous call. Really, this call is just set up for us to have a discussion about anything that you need to get clarification on and any questions that you have. And then from there, you dive into the main questions, you answer the main questions that they have, and you elaborate on the strategy. So you would have given them a brief high level of what you do on the previous call. And on this call, you're going to go into more context, you're going to make them more confident in your ability. From there, once you feel as though you were at a point in the conversation where it's appropriate to ask, you say something along the lines of how would you like to proceed from here? That is the line that I always use. How would you like to proceed from here? They understand what that means. So either you ask that or they naturally just get to a point where they're like, okay, let's do this. How, what are the next steps here? So you say, great. What we would do is send over an agreement that outlines everything that we've discussed in terms of the engagement. We'll send you over the wire information and take care of that wire. And then we're going to send an onboarding email for you to take care of some action items that we need from your end. And then also to schedule in a call with our team to make sure that you're onboarded onto the program and the build out of the system will take at least two weeks to get set up. Sometimes we can get it done within a week, but just to set the expectations correctly, it'll be about two weeks and then you proceed as necessary from there. Now it seems as though it is quite easy. And the answer to that is it is the process is easy. The hard work occurs when you are creating the offer. That is where the hard work happens in here and in the testing, because when you have something that the market actually wants, it's a lot easier to close them. It's a lot easier. And that's the reason why I have this process. It's a framework. It's a framework that you can use. It's not a script. It's a framework. And you don't necessarily need to follow this to a T. It's not something that is rigid. So. The document will be beneath this video to review. You can see that there are call recording examples of me going through this process and closing in two calls. So I would recommend you go and watch those after this video because you can see how the master gets the job done. One thing I'll leave you with is this. It's imperative that you sharpen your communication skills. There are several ways that you can do this. The first of which is by going to an acting class. This may sound crazy, but believe me, it'll help you a lot acting class, you can go to Toastmasters, you can practice public speaking in any way that you can have access to you should be auditing your communication, filming yourself, watching back your calls, making note of how you can improve the way that you say things whenever you say the wrong word, how can you iterate in the future to ensure that you are communicating your clear message as concise as possible. Because this is a superpower. The selling is your communication. You don't need fancy tactics when you can communicate. There are many books written on communication that you can also read. So communication is the precursor to selling because all selling is, is communicating how you are going to provide value and results to another person. That's all it is. I'll see you in the next video.